Hey guys, it's your host Julian. This week I'm sitting down with King of the Hill storyboard artist Whitney Martin. In this episode we chat what those early days on King of the Hill was like for Whitney, his favorite episodes, and some of his fondest memories of working on the series. Whitney was a really great guy to chat with. His recollection of his time working at Foam Roman and the unbelievable time crunch they were all under will for sure paint a picture of what it was like growing up in the industry on King of the Hill. If you guys haven't yet, click on the Patreon link below to check out our early and ad-free content. You can vote on our upcoming retrospectives. And depending on the tier you choose, you can get a special shout out by me on our audio and video platforms. There's a lot more great stuff coming over on our Patreon channel, so make sure you sign up if you're interested. Now, on to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to What's in My Head podcast. I'm your host, Julian, and today I'm joined by Whitney. Whitney, how are you, sir? Hey, good. How are you? Ah, fantastic, man. I've been really looking forward to this one. Ladies and gentlemen, we're doing a more, not a more, we're doing more of King of the Hill Deep Dives, my favorite adult animated series of all time. Like I told Whitney and everybody else, I've seen the series so many times. Whitney here had worked on this one. Uh, we got some great episodes we're going to talk about later, but... How I like to open these ones up because I've always been fascinated. Everybody remembers their first day of anything, first day of high school, first day at their first job, you know, first day with whoever they decide to marry and anything like that. You know, so what was the first day like with you? I got to imagine you started at Film Roman. Uh, is that where you got your start? That's right. Yeah. Film Roman. Thanks for having me, by the way. It's an honor oh, to be absolutely. on the program. Uh, yeah. Film Roman. First day I, I had to do a uh, pencil, uh, a test. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, a storyboard test so uh i had come from disney feature animation uh studying story there and then i had this opportunity to take the test over at king of the hill and i went in and they said if, if we agree with your uh your test and the results then we'll put you on as a revisionist mm -hmm. so i went in i did the test they liked it and i was off and running do you remember what your pencil test was Oh man, we're talking now 25 years ago or yeah. so. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, this, this was 99. So I jumped in around season four, right at the beginning of season four. And, um, the pencil test was just some sort of, you know, a couple pages of script and just to try to see how I was uh, going to lay it out. Of course, everything was analog. It was all Xerox machines, pencils and paper, uh, scotch tape and mm -hmm. i they just had me uh, sit in a little area and, and do it and evidently it worked out and then they just started to cycle me in on uh various episodes to you know just start doing revisions and once they felt that i was up to snuff on revisions which probably took about five four maybe four months if i had to mm -hmm. guess they would then uh, roll me into full episodes which so they did come... and then i finally got go, sorry go ahead no no no. you're perfectly fine but go ahead and finish up no i was gonna say then my first episode um was uh with chuck austin mm -hmm. and uh that was episode six of season four and um i can't remember what it was called though i had written it, written it down i'll have to look that one up to get the name of which show that was because i went to my imdb to mm -hmm. to uh look back at what which ones we were on but then I, you know, came up with the three that uh, that I thought were some of the most memorable ones. But I'm jumping oh, the gun. Boy, oh boy, were they memorable! And ladies and <laughs> gentlemen, like I said, uh, we're going to build a little bit of suspense, and we'll get to those ones shortly. Um, so I've always been I've always been really fascinated with uh, people that jump onto a show that's already established. Because I usually ask a question like, "Hey, man, when did you guys know this show was something?" Uh, I got to imagine in four seasons. Like I was hooked on this show after the first episode, that pilot episode. I put that up there with. I put it up there with the regular show pilot. I don't know if you've ever seen that one. I, I put it up there with the Dexter's Lab pilots, the Powerpuff Girl, anything that I grew up with and that I hold so close and near and dear to my heart. I put it up there as far as a Mount Rushmore-esque pilot. It was fun. It was funny. Uh, like it felt like if this wasn't animated, that this could actually be real. Like I've, at that point in time, I'm 10, 11 years old, whenever it was, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'd, I'd never been to Texas before. But I have to imagine I'm like, man, that that that's what Texas is like, man. You know, so yeah. I always had that thought of like, this just seems real. This seems down home. This seems like 
like I could be a part of this world if it, like I said, if it was real. Um, but mm -hmm. with you coming in four seasons into this, uh, did you have any, did you watch this show really before or was this for your first introduction when you started doing this pencil test? Well, I had been a fan of Mike Judge because uh, I had always loved Beavis and Butthead. So when there was some rumblings about uh, Mike Judge is going to do King of the Hill, mm -hmm. there had been some things in the in the papers and people were looking at different images that uh, were coming up for what the first show was going to look like. And it was definitely sort of a derivative of the Beavis and Butthead world. Um, so yeah, I had seen a few of them, and I, like I said, I was at uh, Disney Feature Animation at the time, mm -hmm. and um, I loved Beavis and Butthead, so the idea of being able to get into that world, and plus I'm from Texas originally, like I, my family goes back into Texas like four generations on my dad's side, so I was in, uh, I grew up in Houston, and uh, a lot of the, a lot of the sort of humor and stuff definitely sort of wrong home with uh, yeah. my upbringing. So, um, so yeah, I was, uh, I was following it and then it was super cool to, uh, get the opportunity to, you know, take that test when I did and jump right in. And, you know, like many shows that I've been on since that time, I'll, I'll have some familiarity with them. Um, mm -hmm. but I'm not necessarily always like a super fan that was, yeah. was like hardcore into it. Uh, um, I just kind of get in and I start to figure it out and, uh, you know, crank. Yeah, man, it's a job at the end of the day, you know, uh, there's, there's this guy that I've had on and he's like, he's, he's a guy that I always go to, like whenever I need to ask a question about animation, cause I'm still, I don't want to say I'm ignorant in a bad way, but I mean, I don't think ignorant can, I think ignorant can be used both positive and negatively. Um, you know, when it comes to the world of animation, I really still feel like I'm learning every day. You know, I'm learning new words, I'm learning new methods, new topics, you know, new techniques, you know, so I'm I'm ever evolving in my knowledge for animation. So there's this guy I go to whenever I just feel like, man, this doesn't seem right. This just seems like it's fishy. I go to this guy named Robert Alvarez, you know, in July, he'll have worked 55 years in animation um, yeah. and he's he, he's retiring. And he's mm -hmm. one of those guys that has no filter, which I absolutely love. I love when somebody cuts the fat and gets straight to the bullshit. He cuts all the all the the maneuvering around and he just tells me as it is, it's either black or white. You know, there's no there's gray sometimes, but he's like, there's black or white. And he's like, this is really what you need to be looking for. So he's that guy going like, look for him. Um, and he told me he's like, you know, just because you work on a show doesn't mean you like it. He was like, at the end of the day, I need to make money. And he was like, mm -hmm. you have no idea. And this is his words. How many how many shows, piece of shit shows I've worked on or piece of shit productions that I've worked on that I did yeah. not give a shit. I was just cashing a check because I've got kids. I got to feed them, you know? Oh, so yeah. that I always just thought it was weird. He was like, and I'm going to tell you something else. If he's like, if you only worked on shows you liked, he was like, you'd go broke really quickly because <laughs> you go six months. He's like, you'll work on a production for six months and then you'll be off for six months because that's just how the work goes. You yeah. know? So I always thought it was fascinating. I'm like, fuck dude, that makes so much sense. And then Mm -hmm. I started implementing that into my everyday life. And I was, I've worked in a lot of restaurants that absolutely suck. You know, yeah. the people have kept me around. Sometimes the money has kept me around, you know, good, bad, mm -hmm. or indifferent. You know, so it's always fascinating to hear you guys say, yeah, man, it's like I'm clocking in, I'm clocking out, I'm give 110% while I'm there. But this isn't me. This My whole life doesn't revolve around this one. You know, mm -hmm. but with something like King of the Hill, I have to imagine this one possibly was different. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I've heard so many folks say, like this, the crew was so tight knit. Like the crew was what kept people coming back because it was one of those times where everybody felt like a family. Everybody was going out to lunch or doing events when they weren't in, you know, when, when they weren't working. Um, mm -hmm. Did that feel like that to you once you started to become a part of this team and this family? Did it feel like a family? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I look back on those days and, and showing up at that studio out there and uh, Simpsons was downstairs and we were upstairs mm -hmm. and, and, you get tight with um, the people on our storyboard team. Then they had the layout floor that had a whole bunch of guys out there. Um, and they would all hang out together. And we were on a, a separate sort of a wing of the office off this hallway where the board teams were. Mm -hmm. And then we would get our own room where the layout guys were all on a big sort of open floor with um, cubicles, you know, so they would mingle and talk. And then when, when we would have our, our big meetings with Clay Hall, um, we would all go out to the big main sort of 
office center and have these meetings. Uh, and a lot of the times the uh, schedule was such that we were in that office with the door shut, cranking away, just trying yeah. to scramble to make the deadlines. And uh, so I got pretty tight with Bill Ryling, who was my buddy um, yeah. in my office. And he's a great guy. And, and we uh, spent many hours in there just cranking towards these uh, these crazy deadlines and post-it notes flying and tape flying and Xerox machine stressing out. We had little boom boxes and uh, and then we would go out into the main area and and hang out with people uh, occasionally. But um, mostly it was just it seemed like, a you know, getting down to the grind with uh, with the board work from my experience, you know. Sure, people were cool and I enjoyed it. And um, but I did hear that there was a, a nice family kind of thing going on with the layout guys and girls in particular, because they were um, in this big sort of open area, you know, and I became friends with some of them. And, and I really enjoyed my time there. Well, that's cool, man. It's always interesting. And it's always fun to hear that, you know, you guys had fun working on something because, you know, I've, I've always <clears throat> thought and I'll go down saying this for almost anything. When you find something that you love, that's enjoyable, that you can just see that the people that worked on it, whether it's like what we, what I do for a living, I cook. You can tell when a kitchen sending out shit and they hate fucking the plate, man. When you, when you see somebody that just doesn't want to be there, it, it sounds douchey and corny, but you can taste it in the food. I don't want to be one of those hokey sentimental dudes, but when somebody just doesn't care, you can taste that. And then oh, I yeah. think you can see that in anything. You can see it in movies. You can see it in animation. When somebody just doesn't give a shit, you see that reflected on the TV screen or on the movie screen. And yeah. every time I tuned in to watch King of the Hill, it felt like everybody gave a shit. So like I mm -hmm. said, I've always appreciated appreciated how hard you guys have worked and and it wasn't until you know talking to bill last week that you know he was like the the, the deadlines were crazy he was like yeah. they were hectic it just seemed like you know a week for this a week for that and then you're on to something next one he's like by the time he's like uh he, i want to paraphrase he was like i felt like when i was about to go he was like a script would slide under the door and he was like <laughs> i was he, he's like i couldn't do that you know so i was like shit man that's yeah. crazy um, yeah, and know. it hasn't changed a whole lot really since those days. It's kind of the same now, you know. So, like, I'm on The Simpsons now, and uh, it's an awesome show. And I'm I'm going into my second season with them, and uh, yeah, it's just it's a fierce uh, kind of a schedule, and you have to mm -hmm. get a lot done. And there's so many layers and so many different sort of things you have to think about as you are boarding to try to uh, you know meet all these different needs and um it's challenging it's exciting it's exhausting uh and you just gotta try to find the best way to uh you know figure out how you're gonna manage to do it all and i'm just grateful that i managed in uh i know we weren't going to talk about origin stories but i've i've been back in the game only five years now i took a break mm -hmm. and i left and i went and played firefighter for a while because i wanted to be a firefighter <laughs> this was after Dude. king of the hill so i went and did that and then while i was doing playing firefighter all of the uh, technology was evolving in such a way that um it was leaving those analog skills and then when i finally came back around you know circle back around and said hey i think i want to get back into animation i realized that i had to learn all of this uh technological stuff because i was trying i was fooling myself thinking oh i can maybe get back in and you know just with my current skill set and no uh, with everything that had sort of combined and converged, um, I realized that to, uh, to be able to understand the pipeline the way it is now, I'd have to go back to school, which I did. Mm -hmm. I went back to graduate school at NC State in North Carolina, where I was living at the time. And um, with the intention of coming back to L.A. and getting back into the business. So I have this uh, I have this weird sort of uh la old school back in the day experience that i had you know and then mm -hmm. i left it and i went and raised a family in new mexico and i went out to north carolina and i did firefighter and then i came back five years in 2018 and boy was it a different you know kind of a, a lot oh, of yeah. similar stuff but very different too at the same time but one thing that's remained consistent is the um the deadlines the deadlines <laughs> and intensity of it all so I'm just glad that I've managed in the five years to stay uh, steadily employed with, you know, minimal kind of um, 
uh, hiatuses, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, cause I know right now things are tough with, uh, the writer strike and, um, situations in studios in general are sort of changing and streaming, working from home, COVID sort of all these different factors oh, yeah. that have come into play that are, uh, impacting this industry. So, um, and I know a lot of people are looking for work right now. I mean, sh sh Disney just laid off, uh, what, 8,000 people? 7,200 people. Like it was like 72, 7,500 yeah, people. I mean, and they're talking huge. about another 5,500 too. That's huge. Yeah. So I, I have friends. I know people that are looking. Uh, you know, I use LinkedIn all the time. LinkedIn is, is like a, has been a huge um, game changer for me in this industry because we use it a lot. You know, my wife is a nurse and works in the medical field. She doesn't use LinkedIn. It's not like really for every field, but I have found that it certainly is um, one that we use a lot in, in this business, you know, yeah, and I can connect with old people and, and, uh, and stay in touch and sort of keep abreast of what's going on, you know? A firefighter ever since I was really little. <laughs> oh, I was the, right? I, yeah, so my first command, uh, and then we'll get right back to King of the Hill, but my first command <laughs> on my first ship I went to, um, I was the first supply guy that was able to try out for the fire team on my first ship. Oh yeah. So yet I was I was one of the quickest people. I was the quickest person in supply that got dressed out. So I could you had to I can't oh, remember sure. what Don, it was. Donning and doffing the yeah. Uh, the uh, Yeah, the fire gear. PPE. Yeah, the fire gear. So I would I wanna say it was either twenty seven seconds or it yeah. was 24 it was something very very quickly and they go like that was really quick especially for a supply guy and i was like yeah. i was trying to change my rate i wanted to be a firefighter because there's this picture of me that i've got somewhere in my house it's me and my uh my grandpa jim's uh he was a volunteer firefighter in panama uh panama city up in the panhandle in florida oh, awesome. so he he had he had all of the uh the rubbers right so he had the helmet yeah. He had the suspender. So there's a picture with me and my grandpa Jim's boots. You know, the pants are so big because I'm like sure. four years old. You know, I'm standing in them. I I still, I've got one goal left that I, I know I'm going to achieve. I know I can achieve this one because I, I live, you know, there's firefighters all over the place, you know, but I, I've <laughs> always wanted to ride on a fire truck that, you know, wasn't going to my house because my house was burning down. I want to yeah. ride on a fire truck so bad. Um, but that's my goal. You ride along? Oh, man. I hope so. And plus, if you have you have the little ones now, you can get you can get them. Uh, you know. Oh, I'm using them. Yeah, I'm using them as, yeah. as chips and ploys. I was like, look at my little kids. They want to see a fire truck, and I'm just mushing my kids out of the way so I can get on the fire truck. Yeah, there's just something very cool. I love. I don't know shit about cars, but there's something so cool about fire trucks. All the switches, all the levers, all the oh, lights. Who and doesn't I'm love so a fascinated. Big red fire truck. You know. I mean. Yeah. So yeah, I went back and. But you know what? It's never too late, man. Like I, uh, I was telling you a little bit earlier about some of the backstory, but mm -hmm. I went in at age 40 into the fire academy. So yeah, Mexico is one of those states where they don't have the age cutoff. Like, like California, I think is 32, and Texas, I think is 32. Uh, but New I think we're the same. I think we're the like, same as the military. Is 32. The, yeah, yeah. And they're like, if you can hang with the academy, welcome aboard, you know? So yeah. it was me and one other dude that was over 40 and everyone else was 19. And uh, I have no regrets. It was awesome. It's part of my uh, story. And, um, you know, I wouldn't have changed a thing. And it was just was interesting coming back to animation because people were like, well, man, you, you know, they're looking at your resume and they're like, no, mm -hmm. you've been out of the game for a while. You know, what were you doing? And I was like, well, uh, I was a firefighter. <laughs> and they're like, that doesn't really have anything to do with animation, you know, but um, Got I just thought it's a, a part of my story. It's just something that I wanted to do and that I did and uh, I'm glad for it. And it, it makes it, it adds to the storytelling abilities that I have. And uh, I bring it into my work whenever I can being on those teams, having that brotherhood, living at the station, you know, mm -hmm. things that we see. And it, it, it becomes part of the fabric of your of your background. So. Uh, I know you would have done it. Absolutely, man. I know you would have done it. We, we have we have that law. It's the same, or not law or guideline, whatever. It is. It's 32. Same thing in Florida. Like same thing for military service. I think it's 32. You can't uh, you can't re-enlist or you can't enlist past 32. And I'll be 34 in August. Same thing with the fire part, uh, fire department here in Florida. I believe I believe it's 32 is the cutoff. Um, yeah. So uh, shit, where was I going with this one? But uh, there was you know getting it back to the king of the hill. Um, yeah. 
Did you get a chance? I, I know it's. I tend to stay away from these questions, but I'd be remiss not to ask. And I know yeah. Fire Department was after King of the Hill, but did you get the chance to work on the episode where they all joined the volunteer firefighter team and no, then they burnt no, down the I fire? Okay. To do that I was about to say, man, that's that's. I wonder if that's where that bug started. <laughs> that fire bug started. So. Yeah. No, my. Uh, I, I don't want to jump the gun. And when you get to what my whatever my favorite episode was, I'll tell you which one it was. But. Um... But yeah, man, you know that the going back to the sensibilities of uh, Mike, Mike Judge, mm -hmm. and uh, the humor from Beavis and Butthead uh, when I was an undergraduate student and at uh, Academy of Art up in San Francisco studying illustration, they used to do the Spike and Mike uh, Animation Festival mm -hmm. or the Second Twisted Animation Festival, and so my wife and I were living up there in the Bay Area, and we would go, you know, uh, go to these uh, uh, screenings. And that was like when Frog Baseball first came out, yeah. um, and it, it was so great. And you know, I, I'm from the area where, where I era where I came up with MTV, and I used to just love that stuff. And it just cracked me up. And uh, it was stupid, but there was something more to it. You know, there, mm -hmm. was, uh, there was some Substance. sophistication going on, some of the absurdity, and uh, it just really resonated with me. And, you know, I, I was telling you earlier, I got to come full circle. And last year I was at Titmouse Studio mm -hmm. working on the Beavis and Butthead movie and then the first and second season of uh, Beavis and Butthead. And like you were saying uh, prior to that, when you get those shows that hit that sweet spot, you know, like always, I, I always have a lot of gratitude, as I was telling you, just to be able to continue to stay employed and working at these different studios, getting these experiences, being with all these great people. But yeah, you hit that sweet spot once in a while, like King of the Hill was, or when I got on Beavis and Butthead, and you're like, oh yeah, like you're reading the scripts and you're cracking up. And at that time, my uh, son, who was at home during the pandemic, was um, sit. We were sharing an office, and I would, mm -hmm. uh, I would, you know, tell him about some crazy thing that I was working on with Beavis and Butthead, and we'd both be cracking up together. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of a cool because he's gone now. He's a firefighter, by the way. Uh, he's gone. Mm -hmm. And we're empty nesters now, but um, so I really uh, cherish those times when, you know, I was hanging with my boy and we were um, able to, you know, crack up over Beavis and Butthead. Yeah. Well, I've got a, uh, I've got a 13 year old that's hitting that stage where I'm like, fuck, I know I was yeah. like this at 13. I, you, you can have <laughs> them if you want. I, there's days where I'm like, dude, I can't wait till you're 18. And then there's other days where he'll come up and he'll give me a yeah. hug. You know, and he'll, oh, yeah. he'll fucking say, I love you, man. Or I, he's like, thank you for what you do. And I'm like, man, you're all right today. Look at that. And I was like, you do have a heart. <laughs> well, North, we moved to North Carolina to Chapel Hill to raise our boys because we were moving around mm -hmm. at the time. And, and we did a stint out there to try to get them into good public schools. And uh, that was primarily why we were out in uh, uh, Chapel Hill at that time. Yeah. And, and again, we don't have any regrets. It was a great place to ha have those boys at that age um, in that environment, you know these characters like obviously we know these characters we love these characters um you know we like each one for different reasons uh mm -hmm. what were some of those characters that you absolutely loved to draw work and write stories for what were those characters that felt like a comfortable pair of shoes you could just slip right into them and subsequently what was the characters that you probably had a hard time slipping into <laughs> dealer's choice you get to pick which one you want to talk about first Sure. Well, I got to say, I gravitated towards Hank and Dale probably more mm -hmm. than uh, some of the others. Bill, I like to draw a lot, too. I thought Bobby was hard to draw because of his design, but he was mm -hmm. fun, you know. But yeah, probably probably uh, Hank and, and, uh, and Dale were two of my favorites to act stuff out with them together, you know. And we would have these uh, old school audio tapes that we would listen to the dialogue on and just play mm -hmm. it over and over and over again and uh yeah they just start to uh, work their way into your head and you know i remember um there was a line in uh uh the tanking it to the streets where all three of them are at the, the I, I storyboarded the section where uh bill it passes out inside of the tank and <laughs> Hank's the block captain yeah. and he comes out and he says uh I'm gonna go investigate or whatever and he gets up yeah. on there and he knocks on it Hank and, kill they block captain. Up and they're like oh my god it stinks you know and they see Bill in there and I, I boarded that whole act out mm -hmm. and um you know and then later Dale pops up from uh, underneath the uh, 
a sewer cover, you know, and then he climbs up on the tank. And then they all start arguing with one another about who's going to drive the tank now. Mm-hmm. And uh, Hank right away says, well, I've been driving, uh, you know, bobtail trucks for blah, 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 you know. And then, uh, and then Dale had this hilarious line that I saw was quoted when I was doing some of the research about Putin, you know? Yeah. And then I remember like, damn, we were talking about Putin back in, <laughs> like he's been the president, you know, we've been talking about him this long. 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he goes in a, and then Dale actually says something in Russian because he sits down inside of the tank. And I remember we had mm-hmm. to like work out how we're going to make it look inside of the tank while they're all in there, you know? And so we were researching this, of course, is, well, we we didn't have uh, Google and stuff yet then, so we were I don't remember how we were getting our pictures and magazines Someone and pictures feverishly yeah combing through magazines or finding videotapes or something, <laughs> and uh, and Dale says uh, well wouldn't it be great or uh, he says yeah I've studied the manual in Russian and Putin <laughs> and then he goes Putin and then we had to draw the Putin part and I remember that was important to get that right. Mm-hmm. And Jeff, I was working with Jeff Myers, um, who was a story supervisor, I believe, on that one. And yeah, Monty Young was the director. And that was just, it was it was so funny because then, you know, later they run over a Khan's uh, bitch Brand and SUV car. at some point. Yeah. He goes, oh, my cherry SUV. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they run over it. And then one of the most hilarious parts for that whole episode was when they go to the little kitty park and Bill yes. puke in the sandbox. <laughs> and he goes, and Bill's all bummed out. Oh, I was just a big old pant load or whatever. And you know, the army fooled me. And then Hank goes, uh, he said, I tried to look up the quote and I couldn't find it, but he says something like, I know you're disappointed in yourself, Bill. We all are. <laughs> Or he, oh, you're, I know you're disappointed with how you turned out, Bill. We all were, right. or something like that. Yeah, it's that, like that's that how it great. went. Like that, that kind yeah. of writing. When you get those types of shows where you're you're cracking up at the writing, you know, because it's mm-hmm. working. You just like, yeah, that's. I mean, it, you know, you hit those sweet spots, and uh, it's just so much fun. Did you get to do any of the old school, like I, I call it old school now, uh, well, everybody calls it old school, but did you get to do any of those old school storyboard pitches for some of these episodes? Well, the way we did it and uh, from the, you know, when I first started there was we would have an all day jam session in a, mm-hmm. in a story room with John Rice was the head uh, story supervisor. And then Jeff Myers at the time that I was there was the like co supervised story supervised. So it was the two of them. And then we'd go in there with the director and my boards after we'd worked on them for, I think we had, um, I don't know if Bill verified this when you talked with Bill about how much time we had to actually do the roughs versus the cleanups. It was like a week. It was like a week each. I think he was saying he was like, I could be off by a little bit, but he's like, it felt <laughs> yeah. like it was a week for each thing. Thumbnails to boards, to cleanups and revisions. Yeah, and stuff it like was that. crazy though. Cause we had like, yeah. 14 pages of script or something then you'd have basically a week to just sort of jam it all out into rough Mm -hmm. form and it was insane amount of stuff to get cover and then uh yeah then you clean it up after but but the midpoint was this uh story meeting so we would just have them all on the table we would sort of go through them together and uh Post-it notes would be flying with Sharpie markers to sort of make adjustments. So it was a few steps away from the old, um, I believe you're referring to Disney, you know, had the cork board. Yeah, the whole and walls the, and shit. And a stick. And yeah, you see, you've seen Joe Ranch do it on uh, the mm-hmm. Pixar videos and stuff, which are really cool. And that's how I learned how to do it while I was still at Disney Feature. I didn't do it in any official capacity, but I trained there at Disney Feature with the intention of trying to get into there story mm-hmm. department but things took a different direction for me um and uh yeah so we would have them all on the table and just sort of jam and you'd have to take all kinds of crazy notes and uh and then you go back and implement all those notes into your cleanups for the next uh i guess it was two weeks mm-hmm. yeah yeah i know he said it was a very very quick turnaround it was one of those things where he's like holy shit i don't know how i'm gonna get this done he was like the stress alone was was palpable uh you know all the time uh you know taking it to the streets 
or love this episode because of, you know, we talked about it before we hit record. You have some of the best Dale lines in here of all time. The whole the whole thing with him, he's like, have you read, you know, the Abrams tank manual back and forth? And he's like, have you, Hank, in Russian, Putin? Yeah. And that's when he goes into that one. And it's just yeah. that. And then when he gives you the statistical breakdown of what's in a uh, sandbox, he's like 30 percent of its fecal yeah. matter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, these, so. these, uh, and then he says, and et cetera, at the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. so great. And then I remember there. we were like, when Bill pukes, we're going to have him run up and he's going to go hit one of those little uh, silly kid bouncy things that's on a big spring, you know, and it'll mm -hmm. it'll do this after he, <laughs> after he bumps into it. So we try to, we would think of all these little things, you know, that would hopefully enhance and, and get a laugh. Yeah, like I said, there, there's just so many, so many scenes in here, and and the one, the one that comes to mind is is that whole sequence leading up to what you what you boarded on, you know, with Hank up there. This is Hank Hill, block captain. You know, he's just like, mm -hmm. I know you guys are army doing whatever you're supposed to do, and he opens it up, and it's like, man, it smells like somebody's dead down there. And you look, and it's yeah. Bill. He's like, oh, it's just Bill. You know, he's passed <laughs> out, and nobody's worried about him because you know it's Bill doing Bill things. But yeah. the whole sequence before uh, Hank running out when dale sees it's a fucking tank he's like oh no they they know that i came and i took pictures of their of their files and shit <laughs> so he goes to the safe room which is just a closet ladies and gentlemen and then he's yeah. like nancy don't let him take you and then he closes the door and then it opens back up and you see that hand <laughs> grow back up and then somehow later he's in his mercenary merchant gear crawling out from the street you know, yeah. it's just there's so many scenes in here that are just so fantastic. Anytime he was on the screen or Cotton Hill was on the screen, those two are my favorite characters of all time. I oh, love yeah. Bobby because I felt like Bobby as a kid, man. I was that chubby, weird kid that always tried to use, you know, uh, fucking humor to get out of stuff. Um, you know, so I felt like that awkward Bobby kid. And it was just like he was the soul of the entire show. But yeah. Dill, or not Dill, excuse me, Dale and Cotton, man, anytime those guys were on the screen, absolute, you know, uh, scene stealers, show stealers, man. Yeah. Um, yeah, two I other worked on the, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the episodes, if you recall, where it was Hank's half brother from uh you know it was a two-parter when they went the japanese back to i went to japan japan <laughs> yeah the hill brothers i tell you what <laughs> <laughs> yeah i got to work on one of those and yeah. uh, i think that was anthony leoy that was directing one of those he's coming on later yeah yeah and that was a lot of fun to do um to do that one but you know you mentioned you mentioned cotton and hank and that was one of the funniest kind of hank had this brother that was a lot like him this you know mm -hmm. half japanese brother that that looked like him and uh yeah down so, to the and, narrow urethra it was fantastic man he had a, <laughs> he had a japanese narrow urethra and i actually talked about this with uh, i had alan jacobson on um yeah shit, probably a couple weeks ago and you know he was talking <clears throat> we had brought up and talked about cotton hill and i was like i, I think without him man i don't get into world war ii the way i am I'm an absolute World War II just buff. Like, I love it. I got to see, you know, I got to go into Pearl Harbor where the, you know, the Arizona and, the, and yeah. you know, the ships are down there and you get to go see the memorial. And then it's the one of the most chilling and haunting things I've ever been a part of, man. You know, you're mm -hmm. literally coming into the harbor and then your yeah. ship is literally passing by where at that time it's like fuck 60 years ago or whatever it was 70 years ago at that point i can't remember it's like 2009 and it happened in a december 7 1941 you know so mm -hmm. roughly you know 68 69 years prior and then you know you're having to hold and render salutes the entire way there's no wake zone you're going three knots which is ladies and gentlemen three miles per hour you know but ship terms so you're going very very slow to not disturb anything because you can still see the oil and the gas coming up from the ship because they oh, yeah. never rose it you know mm -hmm. and just knowing that you know something bad had happened right so you could have been there if you were born 70 plus years ago at that point you know and you're mm -hmm. sitting there you're holding salute and i didn't i didn't realize but i started crying and i didn't understand why and I, i'm like looking around after we're dropping our salutes i'm seeing everybody else cry it was one of the most surreal experiences i've ever had in my life when i was in the military just going over where such a mass casualty happened and just the oh, yeah. epitome of what brought us into the world war ever since like i said cotton hill 
seeing his shins blown off. He's a, you know, World mm-hmm. War II, he killed 50 men, he killed Nazis. You know, mm-hmm. he just ignited that love for World War II history, man. Um, you know, well, so... Well, you being in the Navy, I can see how that would have, uh, you know, how that would have struck home for you to, to go out there in yeah, the walk, right? And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, that's an, that's an impressive uh, memorial for sure. Yeah, it is, man. And getting to go there when there was a World War II survivor there. Like, we pulled into Ford Island where it happened. There's still bullet holes in the hangar bays that are there. You know, mm-hmm. they don't, they didn't do really anything as far as construction or reconstruction goes yeah. or rehabilitation, whatever, whatever word you want to use. Um, you know, but yeah, a lot of that has to do with, with, with Cotton Hill. And I told Alan that, man, I was like, without that show, I don't know if I'm into World War II the way I am. Um, you know, another, another episode you had brought up. And I, like I said, I, I, all three of these, man, I absolutely love. <laughs>